What is life? No Jeopardy. Like, what is life? What's up, loves? It's your favorite blind chick back on your screen with another one. It's been a minute since I did this type of video. I think it's high time since it's been five years and five months to be exact to talk about this, especially since there's a whole bunch of new people to the Sight Squad and Blind Fam. So here goes. This is my Star Guard saga story time. This is how my life has been legally blind. Let's get into it. Okay, let me just put this down. We got a lot to talk about. Grab a snack. This is probably going to be the longest video on my channel to date. So brace yourselves. Okay, so let's start from the beginning. The year is 1988. Okay, maybe not that beginning. Let's go back to the aughts. It's 02. I'm 13, 14 chilling on my grandma's floor. I think this is how I started this video last time I talked about this, but I digress. So pretty much I was visiting my dad for the weekend and I noticed, I had noticed before, but I wanted to let my great grandma know that when I covered my right eye, my left eye, going to the left to the left, trying to be irreplaceable, I had a hard time seeing the words on the page. I remember telling her it looked like ants dancing on a trail. The words would kind of jump and flicker and flutter and she knew that was not normal, so she told my auntie, who is perhaps the most proactive person on the planet, and she took me real quick to get an eye exam. There I was fitted for not one, but two pairs of glasses, and mind you, this is back in the day, so frames weren't as fashionable as they are today. I felt so self-conscious, but at least I could see with clarity. I was also instructed to wear masking tape over the right eye, so I was looking like left eye while I was doing homework, hobbies, or chores in order to strengthen this eye. It so happens that my right eye was better than 2020. Can you believe that now? I'm legally blind, but once upon a time, I had better than 2020 vision, at least in one eye. It was trying to compensate for the left, and eventually I was able to strengthen the left so much that by the time I got the train tracks on, I took the glasses off. I was not trying to look like a dork out here. Super self-conscious, entering high school, I was like, I'm off this. So between 16 and 19, didn't wear glasses, didn't feel like I needed to. My eyes were strong, I felt fine, it was all good. Fast forward to the end of my 19th year. I'm living in Brampton and since most of you guys are international, you don't know what B-Town is, it's where Tory Lanez and Keisha Shante grew up. Okay, besides that, it's a city outside of Toronto. It's about 45 minutes if you drive. Two, if you're like me and you're a commuter because it's not commuter friendly. And I remember so fondly that I used to love looking up at the stars because they were so beautiful and so bright out there. I could see the Big Dipper, Orion's Belt. I tried to find Scorpio, never did. But I also noticed at that time that it was getting harder and harder to see the bus numbers. And when you're in Brampton, you can't afford to take the wrong bus. There'd be four going the same route, but eventually they divert and you'd be in a problematic situation. So I was straining to see from across the street a bus approaching me and I'm like, hola, hola, hola. I'm 19 years old, just got my braces off. So I'm like, you know what? Let me just figure out the situation. Got a bag and fix my teeth. Now that isn't it. I go to where all frugalistas go, Walmart. And I get my eye exam, the first in, what would it have been, six years at that point? I was fitted for a new pair of frames. I opted for contacts because I was still not about that spectacle life. And I remember them specifically saying, we're gonna send you off to a specialist, here's your referral, just in case, because we're trying to get you to the 2020 line and you're not quite there, but we've done some other tests, your reflexes seem fine, you're young, you seem to be healthy, you'll be all right. So I go and one specialist becomes another specialist who becomes another specialist who could, you get the point. Seven specialists later, I was already 20, turning 21 at this point. It's fast forward 2011, January, I'd been 21 for what, two, three months? November baby, Scorpio hives, where are you at? And I was just like, okay, I've heard the terms Stargar's disease. I've done a billion tests. I'm waiting to hear back from this blood test I did a couple weeks back. Let me just live my life. So I was out, I was at a guy's house. He's making hamburgers from scratch and I get a phone call. It's Dr. Samani. Pleasantries are exchanged when I pick up and then he confirms you have the ABC A4 gene. This is after he asked me if I'm sitting down. Why do they ask you if you're sitting down? You expect me to faint from this information, sir? I think the suspense of the question is more annoying than the actual diagnosis. So I'm there standing in the kitchen looking at this guy making hamburgers. 
And unbeknownst to me, possibly because I don't want to take it in, my whole world is flipped upside down like Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. And I just say, oh, okay. And he's like, so how do you feel? I'm like, uh, I'm fine. And then he says, you know, if you need anything, you can reach out to my secretaries. I'm also going to refer you to a low vision specialist who can set you up with visual devices and whatever adaptive technology. And I'm like, okay, cool. Because I already knew when they first started throwing around the term, what, three or four specialists in, I did my whole millennial thing. I became Dr. Google and I looked up what it was. And I was just like... It says seven to 21 years old. I'm already 20. I doubt this is going to be a situation. Like I've come this far. I'm fine. I have enough going up on my life. I got God on my side. This is something light, light work. I can handle this. So anyway, that's the mindset I had from diagnosis to a couple years in. 22, 23, I didn't really let it get to me. But deep down inside, I was very big on not really sharing how I felt about it. I might have only told a handful of people. I knew in speaking it would make it real and also by telling other people I have to accept how I feel and I didn't I just I didn't want to do either. I only told the people I had to which was my manager at Zara and she made some adjustments for me, a couple of my close friends who didn't really see the changes initially. Even I really didn't notice anything. It wasn't until I started working at Casey's. I would have been 22, 23 at the time. And I was still wearing my glasses, hunched over the board like the hunchback of Notre Dame. And people would constantly say, oh, you need a stronger prescription of glasses. Honey, it doesn't get stronger than Prism's $1,200, yo. Like, they can't do better than this. And people would be so shocked, like, what do you mean you can't do better than this? And it was so hard for me to communicate why there was nothing better than these glasses. Because even in my head, I'm just like... Science is supposed to be advanced. We're in the 21st century. Why isn't there something better than this? And people with their smart selves would always suggest, go see another specialist, go get LASIK, go this. And it's just like, I don't even want to explain to you what this disease is and how there's no cure and the treatment. Like, okay, you know better than the person going through it. That began the dissonance between myself and the disease because I couldn't identify with it properly. I couldn't find the words to explain to others, explain to myself what was happening to me. And I didn't even want to accept it. So 24 got really messy. I had gotten out of a situationship. I had been working at a restaurant called Spice Root for a couple of years and I was hating it. And I got in a new job. I was there for about six weeks and then I got let go. Fire, kaput, you gone. I was making so many mistakes, a lot of it because I didn't want to accept that I needed to change how I did things based on my eyesight. I just didn't like finding files and photocopying things, things that would be so easy and effortless and I wouldn't have thought twice. I had to actually find a system to do it and I didn't want to find the system. I just wanted to be able to do it the way I used to. So I was there with this inner conflict and you would never know while the Xerox is going that all this is happening in my head, in my body. I'm just manifesting stress and my vision began to get worse and I began to feel more depressed. And there was a lot of days during these mid twenties where I would just curl up fetal position on the floor when I was at home crying. And it's weird when you have a quote unquote strong friend, you probably can't tell these things because it wasn't like I was out drinking obsessively. I can't even really hold liquor, like one drink and I'm a light, like I'm a lightweight, my friends know. I didn't really dabble in drugs. I tried the weed that didn't work for me. So it's not like you could see me deteriorating and self-destructing, but internally I was having the hardest battle of my life. I'm just like, this is not me. I don't want to be blind. I don't want to be disabled. I don't want to be this. Like it came to the point where I'd be crying at work. I'd crawl into this little cubby where the pop would be stored. And I'd be like, God, I don't want to be this way. Why are the girls making fun of me? Because they'd make fun about me standing in their aura because there were those types of people because I'd be so close trying to see the screen, straining to see, instead of telling them, yo, I can't see, I was that type of person, like I said the last time I did this video, I'd rather be seen as stupid than them know what I see, which lets you know where my mind was. In hindsight, being more grown now, I'm like, girl, you need to get it together. But back then, and even looking back now, I kind of understand what past Alicia felt. I knew the stigma that came with being disabled and I didn't want to attach myself to it. I also didn't want to be it. I didn't want to embody what it was like to live Star Guards and all the struggles that would come with it. So I separated and that distinction was my destruction. 
It was so hard during these times. I had to get really good at compartmentalizing. The people that were really close to me suffered as well because I was a negative Nancy, a pessimistic Patty. I was all types of things and still trying to be a child of God. I would pray tirelessly night and day, God, you are good. You have healed the blind, the lepers. I've seen you do cures and miracles. Like, please, I'm a good person. I would plead, go to prayer circles, have people pray on me, Christian fellowship, church after church after church. Still no cure. This all the while, while Googling like a psychopath, cures, every day, cures. If you looked at my Google search back then, it was Shinaiko songs, cure for star guards, and whatever topic I was filming for YouTube that week. Like it was an obsession to say the least. And it was really consuming me. And all the while I felt like I had no one to talk to. The worst part about this part in my life was that I felt isolated. I remember sharing with my auntie that I was mad at God and she's like, wow, you've really lost your way. For you to be angry at most high really shows where you're at, you're hitting rock bottom. And that for me was like the turning point where I'm like, I can't be like this. Like, I don't wanna be this depressed person. The scariest thing about being depressed is you feel like it'll never end. Like this is who you're gonna be for the rest of your life. Just hopeless and helpless and like nothing's gonna change or get better. And you just want things to just be a little bit better and it doesn't seem to be that way. I efforted really hard. I found myself doing yoga and I really ended up loving it. It was the one hour out of 24 in a day where my mind wasn't destroying me. When I met myself on the mat, I left my limitations behind. I was able to do what the instructor said because I could hear it. Whereas when I was doing hip hop class the year before, I was feeling so self-conscious I couldn't hit the hits or shake my booty a certain way because I couldn't see my reflection or what the instructor was doing. But in yoga, it's just how you feel. And yes, you sweat it out and you get fit in the process. But the reason why I still do yoga today is the mindfulness aspect because I have to remind myself to love myself, to treat myself with kindness or else there's no purpose of being in the present moment. And that's why I push all this present and mindfulness stuff and all that. So anyway, back on track, where are we at? So that's what, 25, 26, I go to Paris. I am committed to changing and shifting my perspective. That trip was very instrumental in me shifting how I thought about life and appreciating the moment for what it was and all of the marvel that was going to Europe for the first time and experiencing it with such a close friend of mine. 27, I was, I think a year or two years in that relationship. That person that I was with was so also instrumental in me building the foundation of realigning myself. This Alicia who I was from birth to 21 and 22 onward was coming to a conjunction where I was trying to live more harmoniously where, okay, I am visually impaired, but this doesn't have to define me negatively. And it was really hard, but it was something that I was striving to do. And that's when I began to share my life legally blind with you. It was, one of the most nerve wracking situations. It's funny, I'm sweating as I'm telling this story, but I don't know why, because 10 years of YouTube under my belt, I shouldn't be nervous for anything. But still, it was in that moment of sharing to you guys on this platform what it was like to lose my vision that really changed things for me. I felt lonely a lot of the times, and I it's sad. It's one thing to be lonely when there's no one around, but it's another thing to know you have loving family and friends and feel alone and lonely with people. Um, 28 was a hot mess, <laughs> just putting it out there. I had a lot of things going on. I was super stressed. I started to think like, you know, I just need to be grateful for what I have because I'm blind and I can't do better or life would be better if I wasn't blind or I should just be happy with what is because this is what it's like now instead of thinking about what I could do. It was just a lot of negative think and talk and it wasn't serving me and I had to effort i started falling into the law of attraction and i fell in love with it i was so into it because i'm like this is a way to manifest a cure not only will i have a cure but everyone with star guys will have a cure if i can manifest it and rp people can get it too i was like this is the best thing since sliced bread surprise surprise i didn't manifest a cure clearly and i was destroyed i was just like wait what is this manifestation ish like if it really worked would there be any hungry people on the planet? Wouldn't they just think 
their hunger away, get a nice plate of food today. Like I was so torn by the idea of being able to create your world. And now I believe in creating your world, but in a different way. But at the time it ended up being more harmful than anything because I thought of it as an escape instead of as a way of training your brain to work for you instead of against you. That was a short-lived stint with the wonderful world of manifestation. I'm 28, 29, and I'm starting to feel those same feelings I had at 24, 25 creeping in, probably because 30 is another milestone. And I was just like, what am I doing? Where am I going? What is life? No jeopardy, like what is life? And I was just like, oh my God, like I literally can't believe that this is what I've done with the last decade. Like my 20s are behind me. And part of it is because of Stark's disease. And I have to sit with that realism. I realized, much like I have since losing my father last year, that grief is something that doesn't go away. I don't even know if it fades, but I always say vision loss is three crimes. The first is the loss of vision itself. The second is the loss of your sense of self. And the third is the loss of what you think life would be. Because there's desires, aspirations, dreams, goals, hopes that you have that simply can't be when you lose your sight and that just is it. Not to say life won't be better or bigger or just simply different than what it is or what it could have been with perfect vision, but it is gonna be different. You have to come to terms and in a way mourn the person you were to accept who you're becoming and to fully come into yourself. It's just, is not an easy journey. I don't think anyone's path in life is easier, but I do, I do really believe that if you're gonna make anything out of this suffering with Stargards and turn it into a struggle with Stargards, you have to shift your perspective. See what I did there? As much as it might be blindsiding, see what I did there again, to be diagnosed with anything, it's up to you once the dust settles to go into the next phase and process things in a way that's gonna serve you. I've said it before and I'll say it again that losing my vision hasn't been the worst thing that's happened to me in my life. That's saying a lot without saying too much. I'm gonna leave it there, but I just, I just wanna, I just wanna put it out there that as much as I've struggled off camera, behind the scenes, a lot of my friends don't even know these stories about me because I conceal it well, and you know, compartmentalizing is a gift and a curse. It's still an ongoing process. There's still days that I have that I'm just like, yo. I don't know where I'd be, but I wouldn't be here if I wasn't living with this eye disease. You have to sit with that thought and think, does it serve me? And is this a positive thought that will pull me through the dark times? And you know, I call my mid twenties the dark ages because it really feels like that. I could have chosen differently. Looking back, you don't know what I would give to have the vision I had back then now. And I tell myself anytime I'm hard on myself or feel shitty about life, that in 11 years, good God, 43, let's not talk about it. I will hopefully look back at this time and be like, thank God I did what I did and I lived how I lived because maybe I won't be able to do what I do and live how I live now then. And that's just how I look going forward. Like it's always in this moment where all the magic and all the power happens. And I don't wanna live in a life, live in a body that I don't appreciate. And so that's why I'm always pushing gratitude more than anything. There's so much more to this story I can tell you. I think I mentioned the last time about the first time I used Eastside eyewear and how before then my mom, being a typical Caribbean mother, didn't really take in the severity of the situation. And then when she saw me wearing that Cyclops device, she switched, became a worry wart extraordinaire. And I had mixed feelings about that. I can talk about that more in another video. I can also talk about what it was like for my dad to become legally blind, what it's like been like to work at the job I work at now, and even some of the years leading up to this job and all the strife and inner turmoil I've had because of it. There's just so many elements. 11 years is a long period of adjusting to something you didn't even know existed before then, and it's, Interesting. Could I sit here and say that I would be me without Stargard's disease? No, there's some beauty in the struggle. There's definitely some elements of myself that I couldn't have been had I not been stressed in that way. The pressure makes the diamond, right? But at the same time, I wouldn't wish it on anybody. At the same time, I think that as much as I've learned and I've grown and I've developed, there's still part of me that mourns the Alicia that didn't go through the suffering and the struggling. 
and there's something to grapple with that. But I don't know. It's think, I think that's more work for me than help for you. And I only want to give things on this platform that helps you. So that's that on that. I mean, if you want a part two, I got so many more details for you. Because like I said, 11 years is a long time. And we're still here. We're still fighting. As long as we got breath in our lungs, we still here. So on that note, I'm going to wrap up this video. Let me know what you found to be most helpful and impactful. If you haven't already, like, share, subscribe. And until next time, stay safe, stay sane, stay blessed. Love and later.